Yeah, thank you, Patsy. Thank you, Rowan and Nicholas, for taking care of all of the uh, logistics and things. Um, my voice is a little bit hoarse right now. Hopefully, what I want to say will come through clearly nonetheless. I'm not sure how many people have experienced a lot of turmoil in your field, a lot of maybe even death of loved ones or of friends or people or your friends of friends or experienced illness or some other kind of ordeal, health problems maybe. I haven't looked at statistics. I don't think that there are statistics that are that up to date. So I don't know if this is just in my circles or if this is general. At the, uh, at the NAS retreat, one of the themes that came up was the futility of the program of comfort and control that seeks to keep out suffering, uh, but always fails. It ends up instead reducing our capacity to withstand hardship and to be comfortable in a broad range of circumstances. For example, if you control the air, the air conditioning, to make the temperature always exactly 68 degrees, it feels really nice. But before you did that, you'd be able to function okay at 60 degrees and at 80 degrees. But the more that you get acclimated to exactly 68 degrees, then 65 feels too cold and 75 feels too warm and the bandwidth, the band of comfort shrinks. And um, basically we become less resilient, less able to feel comfortable. And so what that means is that the suffering will visit no matter what. You know, some people in the uh, discourse of privilege will say, well, you know, we have really nothing to complain about compared to a, uh, you know, Palestinian in Gaza or Sudanese refugee or any number of other people. Objectively speaking, Things are not that bad, it seems. But that's an illusion. Subjectively, things are so bad for so many people in this country that, you know, they're committing suicide in record numbers. They're addicted. They're depressed. The subjective suffering is enormous. behind the brave faces, behind the normality, the appearances of normality. Because illness, pain, death, loss, these visit us no matter what. These are transformative and initiatory processes that are part of life in this realm and in many other realms, they're unavoidable. They're part of the drama that the soul walks through in this lifetime. And they will not be forestalled by any level of air conditioning, figuratively speaking. So, 
these forces have their ebb and flow. They have their moment to act. And sometimes they act for many all at the same time, riding the vehicle of social disruption, war, plague, economic collapse, etc. That's starting to happen. We're entering a time like that. Maybe we've we're already in it, actually, but it has not been visible to all because we have succeeded as a collective in disguising it with the veil of normality. But under the veil, the um, initiation is intensifying. So many people are, I, I was just um, in Asheville visiting a, well, visiting a bunch of people, um, spent some time with a friend, you know, whose um, brother just died, you know, and this other man she was caring for who was just like, you know, my age, maybe a few years older, um, got a turbo cancer, you know, and just died in a matter of six weeks from diagnosis to death. Um, You know, she, she's going through um, quite a uh, process. Single mom, baby daddy's not giving her any money, et cetera, et cetera. Moving house, you know, going through one of these gauntlets. And a lot of people are going through that. Maybe some of you are going through that. Maybe someone you know is going through that. Maybe. Maybe the message that I'm about to give you about such a time can help you or somebody that you can transmit it to. Maybe not in the words I'm using, but to take the spirit of it. And what I want to say is that in these hard times, when you are in pain, when you are feeling loss, when you're in grief, when you can barely hold it together. In those times when you nonetheless choose patience, when no one's, no one's even watching, or you choose peace, you choose forgiveness, you choose kindness, you choose generosity, when you don't even know if you have enough. In those moments, those choices, you exert a magnified impact on the future and on the world, especially when it seems that what you're doing in that moment doesn't matter for the world because you're just with one person. And it's a very small thing, it seems. But in those moments, those choices have a profound impact. They are, as I said at the mass gathering, they are a declaration of what the human being is in such circumstances. And they shape shift the world into accordance with those choices. They issue forth as a prayer saying, this is the world I want. And I want it so much that even when it's hard, I choose it. That's a powerful prayer. Much more powerful than when the going's easy and you're bank account is flush and you give a few bucks as a tip or when you're feeling great in your body and so of course you're effusive in your kindness that is not much of a 
exertion of your will, of your choice. But when you're hurting, when you feel like you've been wronged, when you're angry, and you can still choose these beautiful choices, then you're making a declaration, you're issuing a prayer. And you are filling the planetary grid with a positive energy, with a psychic fuel for the guardians of this world who are holding it together, who are preventing, you know, nuclear catastrophe, who are preventing bioweapons catastrophe, and all the other dangers that could be happening right now. Any of these bioweapons, you know. Um, a friend of mine serves medicine. He uh, was asking a high level, the military official or general, how many times have we just gotten lucky in escaping nuclear disaster? Or how many times have we become, have we come just this close? You know, he was thinking about the Soviet sub commander who got the uh, false order to launch his nuclear missiles and he, he disobeyed the order. It turned out it was an error, you know, uh, or the nuclear bomb that was on a training run mistakenly dropped over Virginia and failed to detonate. And the general said, I know of over 300 incidents of that nature. Now, if I flipped a coin for you and I got three heads in a row, you wouldn't take that as meaning very much. But if I got 300 heads in a row, <clears throat> then you would think that uh, something is messing with that coin flip. Something's messing with the coin flip, people. Whether it is ETs intervening with the launch sequence, or if it is a brave man making the right decision, all of these synchronicities and moral choices draw on the field that we establish when we make such a choice in a situation where it seems not to matter, but actually it matters. And this is something that you can feel. You know, in those moments that this is significant, your mind might say, what does it matter if I shout at this person now? If I am mean to my child, what does it matter? just one tiny little incident and I'm not an important person. I'm not the president with his finger on the button. I'm not a nuclear submarine commander. What does it matter? But something within us knows that these are world creating choices. And that we are powerful. And that fundamentally, no human being is more powerful than any other. Our power comes from those moments when we exert our will and consciousness to choose something that is outside of the programmed choice. That's what shifts things. That's what gives fuel to the forces of synchronicity that guard us. And so I want to remind you of that so that your mind can become the ally of this knowing 
that I have just described. And that you can carry that knowing to others. As we enter tumultuous times, when many people will have the opportunity to make world creating choices. This is how we prepare for these times. I think, I don't know, everybody in my field, people close to me, is going through something. Stella has been having heart problems. Um, we think related to menopause, you know, it was pretty scary a couple times. Um, not everybody all at once, but a lot of people, um, as they say, crunch time comes upon us. Some people will find themselves in a position. sometime in your life when you're when it's not just a small invisible choice when you are the submarine submarine commander when you are the president when you're called upon to decide something for many many people in that situation make the wrong choice and cause tremendous harm to others such things are happening right now when people choose vengeance over peace, for example. That is happening. And sometimes people make the right choice. How do you know that you will make the right choice in such a situation? When all of the programs, temptations, that lust for revenge or vindication for glory, for gain are all pulling at you. How do you know that you'll make the right choice in those moments? If you imagine that you're made of better stuff than Benjamin Netanyahu or Donald Trump or Joe Biden, and I could name many others, if you think you're made of better stuff than them, then you are in danger of making the wrong choice. Because the right choice does not come from being made of better stuff. It doesn't come from your innate superiority. It doesn't come from your innate connection to spirit or your godliness. Because we're all children of God. We're all an emanation of the divine. Where does that moral choice come from? Practice. It comes from practice. And the practice is those small moments that you recognize, your heart recognizes as significant. And that's another way that they are world-creating choices. They program you with another habit. And the mysterious truth also is that they program others with that habit as well. Because as I said before, you are making a declaration of human nature. What does a human being do in such a moment? That moment might be very small for you. But it might be one of those ones that many people's lives depend on. Experientially, they're not that different. The coursing of hormones, you know, the anger, the passion. 
that feeling of that's not right. From the soul's perspective, they're not that different. From the soul's perspective, the decision to let loose on somebody and say the meanest thing you can't imagine isn't that different from the decision to press that button that releases the drone that kills 200 people. Not that different. So I guess what I hope that people take away from what I've shared here is to remember the potency that your choices have, to remember that you are powerful to remember that your choices matter to, uh, and your heart already knows this, your body knows this, but we have grown up, most of us, in a society that contradicts this knowing. And that's why I'm offering your mind a story that conforms to the story to the knowledge that resides in your heart and your body so that we're less confused and more integrated in the knowing. Because the mind is not really separate from the body. And so in this more unified knowledge. Maybe you will feel some serenity because if it is true that you are that powerful, if it is true that choices are available to you, no more and no less than the president of the United States or the CEO of a big corporation, that can change the world just as available to you as to them. If you know that, then you will not feel despair in the face of the tumultuous events that we are about to go through, that have already started, that will accelerate. You will not feel despair. because you'll be able to do something about it. Despair comes when you think you, there's nothing you can do about it. But you'll know better. And you will be able to transmit that knowledge to others. It's a kind of an optimism. It's an optimism that does not ignore the magnitude of the crisis, does not ignore what is happening on this earth. But that does not give those dangers more power, give those negative forces more power than they really have. Because you recognize another source of power, another principle of change. Looking at the military industrial complex, you know, the surveillance state, the power elite, the banking cartels, all of the powers of this earth. It can seem hopeless. If you do not also recognize the principle of change that I have been describing in this 
in this mo in this time here the shape shifting of reality the declaration of a principle of human beingness the issuing of a prayer the establishing of a morphic field a field of change that operates through mundane and mysterious means when you know that that power operates too then there is really no place for despair except to visit it to know what it's like to cleanse the wound that generates it But then to come back to reality, a reality that includes this other principle of change that's in a much bigger reality than the narrow one that requires that you control everything to fight the universe, to maintain your comfort and security as long as possible which is another source of despair because how long can you do that? It's hopeless. You cannot keep it out. Instead, you have to be brave. You know that it too, comfort, discomfort, pain is also part of the human journey, but you know that you can handle it. You know that you'll get through it. You know that there's something on the other side of it. And you know that your conduct through that, through that hard time is extra powerful and you are ready for it. And you are ready to know that others can be ready for it. And we can remind each other. And that's why we have established this new and ancient story network, this community. It's for times like these that so many are starting to go through. And that's all I have to say right now. <laughs>